Welcome back to another episode of the Resellers Mindset Podcast. My name is Mike, also known as the Used Book Guy on YouTube, along with my friend and fellow full-time reseller, Johnny B. We help people start and grow their reselling businesses from the ground up. We also have a weekly Zoom call and private Discord for all YouTube members. Head on over to youtube.com backslash usedbookguy to join the channel and gain access to the full-length podcast, Zoom call, and private Discord today. Let's get into this week's episode. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Resellers Mindset Podcast. Mike, alongside Johnny. I figured you were tired of Johnny this week, so I found somebody bigger and better than Johnny. I'm just messing with you, Johnny. Mel, back from burnout, as you know her, over on the YouTube world. So we're kind of, you know, going to pick on Mel a little bit, see where she's at in her business today, where she's come from, and just jump into things. So Mel, welcome to the podcast. You know, we're great that you're here. Give us a little bit of introduction of yourself for those that don't know. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Mel. I'm from Australia. I am a full-time pre-owned bookseller and <laughs> I, you can find me here on social media sharing my life as a bookseller, I guess. Books. Yeah, books only. I, nice. <laughs> I only do books, yeah. I've got the occasional little bit of media, CDs, DVDs, and it's probably a genre I'd like to expand on a little bit, but I'm not really set up to do discs yet. I don't have the disc cleaning machine and I kind of feel like if I want to expand into another niche, I want to do it. I want to do it properly. So yeah, 99% books at the moment. How long have you been reselling and why did you start reselling? Yeah, I've been reselling now maybe five or six years and I was a family photographer before I did reselling and I was having some health issues. So I kind of the, went off the photography for a few months. And during that few months, I was looking for something to still bring in a bit, bit of money. Found a sneaker community on uh, Instagram. So I started selling brand new Nike shoes from the outlet. And yeah, after, after a few months, Nike started to hit me up and wanted to know if I was a dealer and they wanted me to sign like a waiver saying that I wasn't reselling their shoes, which made me kind of <laughs> go, ooh. So I, then I started looking at what else there was, found out there was a whole reseller community selling secondhand clothes and shoes. So I went down that path uh, for a couple of years and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I couldn't really get any clothes or shoes. So I started doing some call outs on Facebook for books and I did have some books in my store at the time, maybe about 500, and I possibly had about 3,000 items store with about 500 books. But when COVID hit, yeah, I just did a call out for more books on Facebook and asked people to leave them contactless at their door and I would come and pick them up. And that's what happened. And I ended up with just an abundance of books by doing that. My whole house was full. And I just kept listing and kept listing the books. And that's obviously what kept selling because I was listing. And suddenly, before I knew it, I was a full-time bookseller. From Nikes to clothes, now books. Do you like, yeah. do you see yourself staying with books? Or are you like, are they your passion? Like for me personally, I always say this, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not passionate about books. I'm not a huge reader. I just enjoy the money you can make from selling books. But I'm curious, what like, what is that for you? Do you like, are you a big reader? And that's why you kind of decided to go from clothes to books? Or you just said, wait a minute, there's books everywhere. So this is an opportunity where I can't fail, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I like books. I don't have enough time to sit down and read books. So I listen to a lot of audio books or a lot of um, I'm more audio than reading these days and also my eyesight is getting worse and worse these days so I find it more draining to actually read but um, I, I don't know I think I'm one of these resellers who is willing to pivot if like if if suddenly I wasn't able to get a whole lot of books I would definitely pivot into another field like I'm not stuck on books so to speak but I do feel like where I live, there's an abundance of books and it's something that I'm easily able to obtain. So it works for me at this moment. Like the, I've got everything into like good systems so that books works well for me. But yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to having to pivot if I had to pivot again, like when I did with COVID hit. I, I still would, like if I could sell another niche, I would still go back to shoes. I, I love selling shoes. So, yeah, I still occasionally find myself browsing the shoe aisles and occasionally will throw some shoes up into my store randomly. But, yeah, I still I still quite like the shoe process. Yeah. 
Yeah, books are books are a lot of work, and yeah, I think it's, it's so sad, such a saturated category. And we were talking a little bit before this, like you yourself got all the way up to the number three top, you know, bookseller on eBay in Australia. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like give give people a little bit of insight to what that takes to actually get all the way up to number three. I personally suck at eBay. I make it known, like my eBay store <laughs> is lame duck. It's it's just not for me. But I know there's a lot of work a lot more work on eBay than there is in Amazon. So like, give me insight on, you know, being one person getting all the way up to number three before they did away with the report, as you explained before the call, uh, like how much work does this take? I think people underestimate how much work books is. I think books often looks like the easy option in reselling. Like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm going to start, you know, just reselling books. It's easy. I can get books everywhere. Books is a very laborious job and, um, you know, you're constantly living, lifting all these heavy books and so you get surrounded by these big overwhelming hauls of books and I think it's a lot more work than people actually expect. It's um, There's definitely aspects of selling books that's easier than other, like I, it's easier to photograph a book than it is to photograph an item of clothing and even an uh, shoes, do you know what I mean? There's less cleaning, there's less prep. It's easier to photograph, but it it's, takes a lot of storage space, um, you know, a lot of heavy lifting, and it's just like a constant grind. I think the hardest thing about books is you have to be prepared almost, if you want to earn a full-time living doing just books, you have to be prepared to do volume. It's very hard to run a full-time job listing 10 items a day and bringing in enough income just doing books like it's really you there's a lot of books that sell for low-end prices and you're competing in a saturated market for a lot of those books so when you when you compete in the saturated market of course you know often it's a race to the who's got the lowest price <laughs> so when you're competing against the masses and it, and it can be hard to find those higher end books that's a lot of the time that's why I do a lot of bundling to try and get my ASP up higher. But also by bundling, it takes me away from competing with the masses because I'm offering something that's custom made and different to what everybody else is selling. So I think it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of hours. You know, it's not it, to, to get to a higher ranking on on selling used books or to, to make that full-time income is definitely not a a hobby business just doing books it's definitely not a I'm going to list 10 items a day and I'll I'll be rich <laughs> it doesn't happen like that so tell us about living in Australia is it very competitive like it is in the United States as far as books go or is it more laid back everybody loves each other and share and share alike I think it's getting more and more competitive and I'm probably partly to blame for it's that. Your fault. It's your fault now. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. Like the the book market is different today than it was a few years ago. Um, the more I've shared about the book journey, a lot more people are selling books now. So I've definitely created a lot more competition for myself. But um, I guess that, in a way, adds to the challenge. <laughs> I got to stay on top of my game and. You know, there's certain things that I don't publicly share just because I know it will make it even more difficult for myself. But <laughs> it's, yeah, it, I think the book market is definitely, definitely strong. There's 30,000 booksellers in Australia and there's approximately 40,000 sellers on eBay Australia. And so 40,000 sellers on eBay Australia and 30,000 of them. Three out of books. four are booksellers. That's amazing. Yeah. Whether or not they've got hundreds of books or just a few books, but yeah, the eBay eBay told me when I met them at the last conference that they had forty thousand users, and on the quality listing report it says there's thirty thousand bookseller used booksellers. Yeah, I remember when I first started getting into my reselling book career, you were one of the few people that were actually doing books on YouTube. It was the you mm -hmm. and Creator of the Lost, I think, were the two book people at the time on YouTube. Um, yeah. That, that since changed. I've even seen a lot more book people on YouTube uh, as in 20, whatever year are we in? 2024 now. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. When I went to YouTube sharing my book journey and said I was going to be a full-time bookseller, I actually um, 
you know, had people say to me that it was going to ruin my channel because niching down like that, nobody would want to watch somebody who only just sold books because a lot of people didn't sell books. So people actually told me it would hurt my YouTube channel, whereas it ha it hasn't done that at all. I, I don't, I've got people that follow me for YouTube for the books and I've got other people that don't sell books and couldn't care less what I sell. They still will follow me. So yeah, <laughs> it was interesting that I did um, there was a lot of people who told me I was basically doing career suicide by by just doing books, niching on the books. Are you, in fact, the biggest content creator on YouTube who focuses on reselling books, or is there somebody bigger than you? Um, There's nobody bigger, I don't think I don't so. think there is. I think you're at the top of the food chain there. They, there was always Raken. Raken used to sell the books. Oh, I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where he is anymore. But um, yeah, I don't. Maybe I am. I don't you know. Are. Yeah, Raken's moved on to eBay to Amazon now. Uh, yeah, he, he left us book hustlers behind. But uh, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is interesting. Me and me and Johnny did a podcast talking about what ifs and juggling like family responsibilities, right? Like, I got my wife and cats. It's different for you. You have actual children to take care of. So if you're fine with it, give us some insight to being a reseller and having the responsibility of children and how that can, you know, weigh in on your reselling business in a good way. And then possibly, you know, sometimes you got to take them to soccer practice or this or that, you know, whatever you got going on. Yeah, it's definitely hard. It's definitely hard with children. And I guess I'm lucky that I've got four children but they're now 23, 21, 19, and 14. So three of them are, you know, adults and kind of can drive and do their own things. And they're very, even my 14-year-old is very independent. But I guess I've worked from home since my first child was born, doing side jobs from the home, from my garage. Um, I've, I've always done that since the moment my daughter was born. So I guess they've kind of grown up with me. If it wasn't reselling, it was something along the line that I was doing at home on the internet. So I guess it's one of the benefits of working from home and working for yourself. It's something that I've always liked. I've got that flexibility that I can just pack up and go to their, you know, I've been able to go to all their sports, all their school plays, all their assemblies. <laughs> I've been very blessed that I've been able to do that for the entire life of my, my kids and I'll never take that for granted but it's definitely hard. You you have to be organized. You have to kind of be, you have to plan things. You have to meal plan. <laughs> and it, it's definitely a juggle when you've got so much on your, on your plate. And I do think that that's partly like over the years is probably why I have gone in and out of burnout because when I've got a lot on my on my plate, I get very overwhelmed and then I find it very hard to focus on what needs to be done and what needs to be prioritized. So, yeah, I think that's probably with the amount of hats that I have to wear in my daily life is probably the reason, the biggest struggle that I have and the biggest biggest way that I get overwhelmed in life, which when you're overwhelmed, it always hinders you from being productive. So, yeah, it's a big, big juggle. We asked uh, Tech and Sports the same thing uh, about his, his kiddos and, or do you kid? Do your kids think you're crazy for like being a reseller, or like are they involved? Do they help you in the reselling business? No, they don't want to. They're not interested in it. They don't want to help. They kind of find it at first. They found it a bit like, oh, she's going to the charity shops. Like yuck. <laughs> they weren't really the the. I had never really been into charity shops until I started reselling. It wasn't somewhere where I actively used to shop or anything before I was a reseller so the kids weren't kind of used to going to those shops beforehand so they didn't really understand the whole secondhand shops and things like that but no they're not interested in it they're um I don't think they I don't know I don't know if they think it's a little bit of an odd job <laughs> but I think they understand why I do it and they can see that the business is growing every day and they used to be a little bit um, they didn't really, at first with the YouTube, they didn't want to tell anybody that I was a YouTuber or anything, but once I got to a certain level, then they started to kind of be proud of it and tell their friends what I did. So I think there was an element when I was smaller that they maybe kept it to themselves because it wasn't the norm. But now that I'm out there, they're, they're kind of very open with it. 
So between your YouTube business and your eBay business, you have um, a ratio of how much time you put into one and the other. At the, mo uh, at the moment, I would put more into my eBay and that's not really due because that's not really because I want to do that. I, I actually really love the YouTube side of it. I love, you know, it's quite boring really doing eBay and just sitting there entering into the, it's like entering a spreadsheet constantly, like YouTube is much more fun and I get to be creative. So I, so I obviously enjoy that side of it more, but eBay is where my main income comes from. eBay pays me weekly, YouTube pays me monthly and, you know, I'm very reliant, especially now more than ever, on my weekly income. So eBay probably takes a priority at the moment, but um, it doesn't, I don't necessarily want it to be like that. I would like it to be like a very even split, but finding finding the time to juggle it all and finding a good schedule at the moment has just been really hard. Uh, yeah, it's very fair. Now, with all the the ducks in the pond if you will mm -hmm. uh, you have people to help you with either aspect of the business like editor or somebody helps you with the book hauling just no, you it's all, all you all <laughs> you it's all me I think um later on towards like at the end of this year I probably would like to hire some help in the eBay business and that would just be somebody maybe helping me to pick and pack my items, somebody to help me with photographs and prepping and taking the stickers off books and um, getting thing, getting all that side of it ready. Where, um, probably I'll still maintain doing the listing, but just having somebody in there to help me with the pick and pack and the shipping as well. Also, like my warehouse is about 50 minutes away from my house. So it would be really good if I could have somebody in there for a few hours every single day. So if there's a day that I want to stay here working on the YouTube side of it, I can still have somebody getting out my orders for me. Like even if that's all they did um, a couple of days of the week is just pick and pack my orders. That would be big help. So but the, the YouTube, I can't, I can't hand over the YouTube to right. like, it's such a creative, creative thing for me. I've, I don't feel like I can hand, I need control of that. <laughs> so, yeah. Johnny, uh, we might know a guy that lives in Australia that could help her out at her warehouse. We just had him on not too many weeks ago. No, he is <laughs> everybody now. No, no. <laughs> so uh, that's your warehouse. How big is it? And have you ever filled it up into its maximum capacity? So the warehouse, and I'm not sure what this is going to be in American terms, but for me, it's almost 11 meters long and five and a half meters wide. 33, so I know. 16 and a half feet. Yeah. Americans. I was going to say, I know you use square feet and stuff, so I don't know what that is. I didn't, I can't do square feet in my head. Maybe my can. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's pretty big though. Yeah. And if you ever filled it up to its maximum. It's getting... Like it's getting pretty full now. I could go higher if I had some different shelving, but I don't have different shelving. It would be very expensive to change all the shelving at the moment. So that's that's not happening just yet. But the actual warehouse is getting like my shelves are getting very full at the moment. So I am really trying to focus at the moment on my sell-through rate, trying to increase that sell-through rate so I can get those books moving a little bit faster so I can keep putting more books in there and, hopefully not getting too full because <laughs> that is space is a space is an issue oh yeah I, I completely hear you so how many books do you think you have in your warehouse at present i got about seven thousand listings but a lot of them are bundles so there's a right. lot more than seven thousand books so but i don't have very much death pile in there at the moment it's just basically what's being bought coming in, getting that listed straight away. I've kind of eliminated all the death piles. So I don't just have boxes and shelves full of unlisted inventory. Almost everything that's in there now is listed. So the space has been utilized by actual listed items, which is what I want. Uh, I'm curious here, if anybody that's like followed your journey on YouTube, you kind of like, I don't know, like I titled this podcast I sent you like the year of Mel. You kind of like, I don't want to say reinvented yourself this year, because you're, you know, you're always hard working. I'm not gonna say, oh, you weren't working hard, hard before. I mm -hmm. think you're just probably working smarter now. Uh, give some insight on like 
where you were at last year to where you're at today and like the the death pile that you got yourself through um, that some of us have seen on social media, YouTube, Instagram, uh, just give some insight to, you know, what was the wake up call to you? And are you happy with where you're at today moving forward? Or are you still looking to progress? Yeah, so I'm, like if anybody who doesn't follow me, my whole, like I separated from my husband husband so basically what happened is I w was the secondary income earner in the marriage and one day basically went from the two incomes to just being my income <laughs> and when you suddenly have gone from you know not being the breadwinner of the family and next minute you are financially independent on your own I wasn't earning enough money that was like a full-time income for myself so I really had to step up into my business and take it from this like secondary income job to a full-time earning job and it as we all know with ebay that doesn't happen overnight like that takes months to actually bring that income up maybe even years <laughs> it's not an easy task so i had to really um change my whole working life I guess it, it was a little bit different because before I when I was the secondary income earner I was kind of primarily there doing everything for the kids once my husband and I separated we went on to a week on week off so by by me having like that week off with the kids responsibilities that allowed me to change my time that I was actually able to work I wasn't interrupted by appointments and school runs so I was actually able to do some really long hours every second week so that I can get that get that business actually growing for the first time ever I felt like I was actually able to get the business growing to its full capacity so I had developed like a huge death pile as they call it like an unlisted inventory pile and that was really just because I was buying and buying and getting these hauls and I just didn't have the time to process it but once I had this every second week and I had these longer hours, I just started to do big hours in the warehouse, 12 hours, 13 hours, 14 some days. And I was just working through that unlisted inventory pile that had been really overwhelming. And in turn, by doing that, it brought my sales right up, increased my sales, you know, doubled my 90 day total within three months and you know, that was exactly the start that I needed. But my 90 day total is still increasing. The mo It's not as increasing as fast anymore as it was in when, when I initially doubled it. It's a little bit slower now to increase, but I'm still working on it. And it's not where I want it to be, but it's much closer to where I need it to be. <laughs> so, yeah. I remember saying work. you had you had so many books in that warehouse. I was just thinking to myself, like, holy smokes. It's like, yeah, do you know how many books you probably listed in the past, you know, since the beginning of this year? Oh, uh, not, so, not as many from the beginning of this year, but from October last year, I was listing, you know, hundreds a week, like maybe like five or 600 at least every single week was going into the store. And that was on top of doing all the cleanup. So I was I was not only going through the death pile and sorting it and cleaning it and organizing it and culling it, but I was listing really, really hard on top of that. So it's it's been, this year has actually been really, really busy. I've actually found it hard um, in the last like four or six weeks to be able to get as many listings done as I've needed just because I did move house and, you know, I've had a couple of weekends that I've had things on where I haven't been able to dedicate the same amount of time. So, but March is looking pretty quiet and I'm ready to like really put some big hours again coming up now, March, to really try and bump that 90 day total over the next milestone. So we all don't like change. So what is the biggest thing you resisted in your business? But once you changed over to that thing, it was like, why did I wait so long? I think it was the it's the um the, it's the processing. <laughs> so that was the that was my biggest issue. Like the the stuff would come in and I just wouldn't process it instantly. I would just sit it there in the corner and then new stuff would keep coming in and I would cherry pick what I wanted to list and what would be photographed next from this big death pile. Whereas now the processing gets done instantly as soon as something comes in, 
I process it even if I don't feel like it, even if it's an item that I don't really want to and I'd rather sit it there. The processing has been the biggest change that I've made, getting that stuff done. As soon as, as, soon as I buy it, get it listed, don't leave it sitting there. And that's been the biggest change for my business. And it's also what is, keeps increasing my income because now as soon as I buy it, it's actually getting listed. So, yeah. So tell me about Amazon in Australia. As <laughs> people may not listen to Tom's recording, may not realize how what Amazon life is in Australia. It's pretty very much non-existent for most of us. Amazon is totally different in Australia than it is in America. I think it is getting bigger in Australia, but it's still just not a platform that most of us use. I, I have never, ever ordered off Amazon Australia. Like it's just not a platform that I even look at or consider going to to buy something. So for a long time, they weren't letting anything that was secondhand being sold on Amazon. In the last couple of years, they've been trialing selling used books and they had a select few um resellers that were selling the used books and now anybody can come on there and sell you just apply for it and you can sell the used books I did speak to somebody who was selling used books they had like 15,000 listings and they were selling one wow. a day so wow. I was really like yeah I'm not interested in a sell-through rate That's all sell -through that time rate. <laughs> wow yeah and it, maybe it's increased a little bit now maybe the platform's getting a little bit more traction but I think the reason, like people often say to me, you get so much money for your books on eBay Australia. And I think it's just the fact that we don't have any other platforms to compete with. Compete with. I'm not competing against all the Amazon sellers like you are in America. I'm not com competing with big media mail companies um, that sell everything for pittance. So I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm very lucky. Amazon's just... It's it's not even in my radar, the Amazon at the moment. So I am curious, is that fifteen thousand sent into the warehouse or is that fifteen thousand sold at some facility like a merchant fulfilled kind of deal? Uh they had fifteen thousand that was merchant fulfilled. Ah, okay. I wonder yeah. what the FBA is like. I think you should send a yeah. box to see what happens. It's really quite expensive to hold the stock at the FBA. So yeah. like I have looked into it, but the costs are very high. And, you know, if you if you don't have a fast sell-through rate, you're going to pay a lot of money or that stuff's just going to end up being sent back to you and it will cost you money just sitting there. So I think you would have to choose books that have a very fast sell-through rate. Right. And I don't know. I Obviously, I do have a lot of books that sell, very, like have a fast sell-through rate, but some of them also are like a six nine 12 month sell through rate and i just think that's too long for amazon especially at the the level that it is here in australia i i would not want stock that's got a 12 month sell through rate being held at amazon mm. go ahead Johnny. no go ahead. okay fine so have you do you sell anywhere else besides ebay help oh. all ebay okay all ebay uh, Pretty boring, hey. I don't even sell on Facebook. <laughs> I, I I stay away from Facebook Marketplace, really, mainly because my YouTube. I don't want people coming to my place and stuff like that, or I don't want people saying I bought books from Mill and they were rubbish. Sure, <laughs> so I just really stay away from the Facebook platform now. Gotcha. So, were you in any other groups before Reseller Nirvana? And now we're in reseller greatness before or was yeah. that your first group that you actually joined yeah that was definitely my first patreon or any kind of group that's that like that you know I was in facebook marketplace i mean facebook you know reseller groups but nothing like the the zoom or the patreon like it's been it's actually been life changing for me really to be part of that group like yeah i I've learned so much from being in that group. And yeah, I can't, honestly, I can't thank Tech enough for everything he's done for me. He's been amazing. Yeah. There's a lot that goes, a lot to be said when you surround yourself with like-minded people. And I know like it sounds kind of cheesy, like maybe coming from me or Mel, like we're on YouTube, we make YouTube videos. Like we like talking to people and respond to every single comment we get on YouTube. But there is a lot to be said to have people that have the same goal or same mentality of working towards and an end goal or getting to a certain point in their reselling career when you have those you know 
voices in your ear, it just uplifts everybody. And that's one thing like I like to see on YouTube is reselling people that are uplifting everybody. Hey, you know, like everybody here can win. Every, you know, us three sitting here, if we wanted to make a million dollars selling books, we could. We really put our mind to it and put in the hours we could. There's nothing limiting you besides yourself and reselling. So I'm curious, your YouTube journey, why did you decide to go down the rabbit hole of being mm -hmm. on YouTube? Because we already kind of said, you know, like YouTube doesn't pay the bills. So like we have to, our resell business needs to be our focus. Sure. YouTube's fun. We enjoy doing it, but the reselling business pays the majority of our bills. So what got you into YouTube? And I'm like, what are some future plans for your YouTube channel? I know you really enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, I think it was just the, that community side of it. Like I've always, I'd always worked from home and I'd never had a community in any other, in any of the other jobs that I'd done. I'd never had a community. So when I found the reselling community and found this whole online thing and the YouTube thing, I just, I'm a people person and I get my energy from other people. So I just absolutely loved all these live streams and you could go in there and you could chit chat and I'd never had anything like it working from home. So I had like my little Instagram page and once I got to a thousand followers on Instagram, I thought, oh, maybe people, maybe I should start a channel. Maybe people would be, they seem to be interested in what I'm doing. Maybe I'll start a channel and get more involved. And that's basically how it started. And I, I don't think I ever really thought that the YouTube would end up being something that I would love to do as a full-time job. It just was kind of there as a social thing, bit of fun and I just enjoyed the whole pro. I was a photographer, family photographer before I did reselling. So I was kind of used to the camera and um, I, I, I enjoyed that side. I, yeah, I always just enjoyed the vlogging side of it. And I've continued to enjoy the vlogging side of it more than the actual going to YouTube to be like a, a teacher or do tutorials or stuff. It's not really something... I don't really enjoy doing the tutorial side of YouTube. I prefer to just tell my story and vlog my life and show what I'm doing. And yeah, I just, I loved the community side of it. So, yeah. So when it comes to doing eBay listing, is there a genre or type of book format wise that you just find slightly more annoying than all the rest? <laughs> yes. The books that you like, Johnny. <laughs> The, the the hard books, the rare Anquarian books like that take me longer to price comp, I, I'm just not interested in them. I prefer the more bread and butter, quick ones so that I can just look up quickly, make a quick decision on. It takes me one second to look at what the the last top five have sold for and make my, you know, sale oh, price. You're right. Some of mine don't even have souls. Like, what do I do with it? Well, I guess I make my own price up today. Yeah, yeah, I've, I, I'm not really interested in like I don't find the research like the research side of it f fun. <laughs> like some people love learning about that research and they dig right into the book and they want to learn the history of it and really dig deep on how much it's worth and where it's come from. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in getting my book up for sale and making a profit on it, turning it over and buying another book. So anything that takes me longer than like two seconds to price comp <laughs> is a pain for me. So I tend to steer away from those halls or those books where they're, 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 they're books that I'm less knowledgeable about. And I tend to just stick with the genres that I know a lot about. They're very common, can churn them in and out and that works for me. <laughs> Ironically, I don't like the books you like to list, the big coffee table yep. books and the bundle stuff, because I just hate storing it. It's always, it's a puzzle. I hate puzzles like that. I enjoy puzzles, but not that one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, <laughs> we, we're completely the opposite. Right. How but many, like, how many photos per book are you doing for your eBay listings? Um, As many as it needs. As on the quality listing report, I think it said my average was 12. So like if it's just a basic fiction book, it's about eight, eight front, back, the four sides, the copyright page, maybe a photo of the text inside. I generally show a picture of the page just so they can see the size of the, the text inside a book or that there's no writing or something like that. But if it's an illustrated book, like a, a like a coffee table book or a cookbook or a book about gardening or plants or something like that, then I always show photos of the illustrations inside and I'll take 
um as many photos as need be so yeah that, sometimes dummy. sometimes i feel yeah sometimes i'll feel the 24 photos sometimes i'll have more than 24 photos or tell me there's too many so yeah it, it's the basic books it's normally eight at the minimum but yeah on average i'd say about 12 do you have a minimum like sales price like for me now with ebay since i suck at it and i just you know i don't have enough inventory for ebay like I don't list anything unless I'm going to list it for at least $19.99. Do you have like a minimum floor price when it comes to what you're willing to list? So I'm trying to not list anything under the $25 mark, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> so now anything that I'm listing under the $25 mark, I'm trying to make sure that it's got a faster sell through rate because I will sell things that are under that $25 if I can move, if if I can move them over faster. Um but there's there will, I don't put anything in my store that's under fifteen dollars because then I'm literally making no no money on it. So the only only books that kind of go in there at that fifteen dollar mark, they're normally like low end fiction books. And fifteen dollars includes postage as well. And I try and offer like coupon deals and stuff, so it's like a buy two get two free or something like that. So that way. If they buy two, it still means they're getting like a $30 spend, but I can put four in. And because I charge free postage, you know, like it, I still make profit selling four books for the price of two. And then I'm still hitting that $30 mark, which still goes above the, the base metric that I'd like to like to hit. So when I do put those lower end books in, I try not to put kind of like one-off books that are that price. I'm trying to put books that are either by the same author or the same topic in my store so to entice people to come in and buy like multiple books if they're going to buy them at that price. So let's talk sourcing for a minute. Did it take mm -hmm. you a while to figure out how to source books or was it per fairly easy for you where you're at in the world? Um, I don't think it really took a long time, but it takes a long time to build that Rolodex up in your your head, I guess, of what actually is going to sell. And that takes practice and that takes, you know, mistakes. And, you know, it takes listing a lot of books to know what sells fast and what actually takes a year or more that, to sell that you would never actually want to sell again into your store. So you can look at the comps and you can do all that kind of stuff. But I do find sometimes that what sells for somebody else might not sell for me. And um, I tend to focus on trying to list a lot of the same books in same types of books into my store or books on the same topic because I find that brings those repeat repeat buyers back to my store and also brings the multiple sales. So it, it I don't think it's so much of a hard thing to learn, but it just takes a long time to build that knowledge of, you know, what is actually going to sell in your particular store. Now, do you have like a dedicated route when you go sourcing or do you have assigned days or what's the organization life of sourcing if there is one? Or is it just, let's go sourcing today? <laughs> My life doesn't feel very organized at all. I do not run to a schedule. Um, I don't really have a route that I do. I do have um, particular stores that I go to regularly and often. So I've definitely got my favorite stores, my honey holes, and I don't show those honey holes on YouTube. <laughs> so <Yeah>. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I yeah, I don't I don't share my stores that I, I shop at regularly on YouTube for those reasons. But um I don't really have set days or anything. It's really just worked around when I've got time, what's going on. I do a lot of my sourcing with Tom, so it also depends on his schedule and you know we do, we do a lot of sourcing as well that's a couple of hours away from where we actually are. So we do travel. And so normally when we go sourcing, we will make it like like a bit of a day trip or at least half a day trip where we're out going to as many stores as we possibly can in the time frame that we've got. Yeah. So is there a type of area, like a library sale versus a charity shop kind of deal that you haven't done that's on the reseller bucket list to go to? Mine's like the shipyards and see what I can do there. That's like down the road. Just figure that out as I go. Um, Not really. I think the, the main place that I like to source is at the book fairs. So... 
Tom and I, like we have a big book fair twice a year where we live and there's other big book fairs around Australia and we like to kind of travel to the ones that were normally the ones that are within about three hours from where we are. We will travel to those book fairs, but there's probably a couple more that are, you know, further away that we'd like to kind of go to. But to go, to go further than that, you end up requiring to stay there a night or two. You need to take a big truck when there's two of us buying a lot of books and it just becomes quite a costly costly trip. <laughs> and, you know, when you need to take a couple of days off the business as well, you've also got to equate for the time that you're losing not being actually there in the business doing the actual business work as well. The topic but, yeah, of the book fairs. The book fairs, that's like, um, I guess as people would think of it as equivalent to like a, a library book sale here in the States. Um, I'm curious because a lot of the library book sales, well, not a lot, every, every library book sale I've ever been to, these people are maniacs, Mel. Like I took my wife to one and they're like running her over to get to the books. Like what is the vibe over there when it comes to, you know, these these book fairs? Is there a line when you show up, people camped outside? I've I've seen this happen. You know, people are waiting yeah. a day before the sale. Are people polite and courteous or like, you know, or is it just chaos? No, people are polite and courteous. On the first day of book fair, there's normally like a big line. And like the one that was recently just here where I live, we it opened at nine o'clock in the morning. I got there at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, was it around about seven or something? But the the people were we were standing within line. They had been there since six o'clock in the morning, and and they were not the first in the line. There was people there earlier, so there are some people that get there, you know, hours beforehand. But I find that the people, almost those people, quite often they're collectors. They know the one table that they've got to go to to get their stuff before the resellers get there. And so they will line up and get there very, very early to go to there. They know exactly where they're going and exactly what they're looking for. So you've got you've got a mixture of the resellers and the collectors who are going to the book fairs. But, you know, they're, they're not push and shove inside there. Everybody's courteous inside there. Um and yeah, the book, the book fit, we don't really have big library sales here. That's not a, I've never been to a library sale. It's not a thing that we have definitely where I live, whether or not they've got them in other states of Australia, I'm not sure, but there's, there's definitely nothing like that here where I am. I am. The only time I occasionally will get ex library books is in a charity shop and they might have some for sale there, but I've never actually been to a, a library book sale, but the book fairs are fantastic. Do they have, um, are you able to purchase books at your libraries? Not that they have a sale, but just maybe a dedicated bookstore within the library. They don't have that either. No. So is there a big overall goal for 2024 you're wanting to hit? Um, I think 2024, I'm aiming for 200,000 in sales. That's my sales goal. Um, so fingers crossed, <laughs> no, it still won't be quite where I want to be, but like, I think that's the capacity that I can probably reach this year. So that's my sales goal. But I think, I think the, the, the goal is just to maintain more consistency this year and to stay on top of it and not get snowed under, not get behind and ma mostly that consistency, because that's the biggest thing I struggle with in my life is just consistency. And I fall off the wagon very quickly and very easily. And I'm not tech's ideal student who lists consistently every single day. <laughs> that's, I'm not his best student in that way. <laughs> I, I do try my best, but I, I'm definitely not that person. So I need to be careful that I don't fall off that wagon for too long. <laughs> so yeah, cons consistency to, to hit that goal will be my biggest thing. So when you find yourself being inconsistent, how do you get back on the consistent bandwagon? It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. I guess I feel like um, a lot of, uh, this is something that I say quite often. A lot of people are always like, how do you be motivated? How do you get motivated when you're not motivated? And I truly believe that um, productivity is what causes motivation. So instead of focusing on how do we get motivated, we should just be focused on productivity. What can I do today? And then the more productive we are, the more motivation that naturally causes. Because when you're productive, you're like, yes, look what I did. 
and then you want to go and do more. So the hardest bit when you're lacking or being inconsistent is just trying to do something that's productive, giving yourself a high five, ticking it off. I did this, even if it's a small goal, and then you, the more you do it, the more productive you are. I just find the more motivation you get and then you you can build back that consistency after after being down or low or when you've taken a hit and you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So, yeah. I mean, mine's music. I mean, Mike knows this and Mike's wife thinks I work at a club, honestly, because sometimes my, <laughs> it's, my music's just blaring all the time. It's how I get through the day. Pretty sure my employee halfway hates me because of this, but only halfway. It's more than halfway, dude. I can't imagine what you're playing over there. Oh, I was going to say, it depends on what you're playing, Johnny. <laughs> I hate my hate on a daily basis. I think it brings you back, though, to the the benefit of being in the group, you know, like how you're one of the pillars over in text group, right? It's like, if we have a down and out day, you just pop in the group for five minutes, you're going to see all these people that are like making these huge jumps and success stories. And it kind of just like, I always think to myself, that's a big benefit of like having a YouTube channel is like, I don't know. It kind of motivates me. Like, I don't want to be the the lowest slacker on the totem pole. I'm always like, listen, if everybody else is out here working, then I got to be like, I can't be a, a YouTuber and tell people, yeah, go resell on Amazon when I'm not even doing it myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the thing I like about the group is that everybody is growth focused and it doesn't matter if you're small seller, medium seller, large seller, everybody in there is happy to help or give advice and cheer each other on. No, no matter if you're lifting five things a day or a hundred things a day, people will cheer you on in the same way. And I just find that it is a nice space to be in because everybody is so growth focused or focused on improving themselves or their business compared to the other Facebook groups where there's just people coming in and constantly being negative or whinging or talking, you know, complaining about their low sales or their negative customers or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, they're looking for validation on whatever it is. And I just find text group is very, you come in, you be positive. If it's, if eBay's a roller coaster, if you're having a slow day, you just stay positive and keep going. I will say, and I hope you don't take this disrespectfully, Mike, it was a big shift when I joined Mike's group coming from uh, daily refinement at the time. And I had to slow my role and my intensity because, as you know, it's very number intensive, growth focused. Um, and I had to like, there's different ways to do things. And that kind of put things in a humbling perspective. Respectfully, mm -hmm. Mike. Hey. I don't, I don't take no offense to anything. All right. I just want everybody to make a little bit of money so you can quit the job you're miserable at. Like that needs to be a slogan that I have. Uh, it is, it is fun though, like to have groups and be involved and see other people and you get in the right mindset. And the problem is it works both ways. Right. So like if me, Mel and Johnny just always whine to each other about how eBay sucks and how Amazon sucks, like you really start to believe the things that you hear around you all the time. And that's why it's so important to, you know, be in the right mindset. And if you have somebody, you know, if Johnny was always whining in my ear, I'd be like, yo, Johnny, like stop whining or like, I, we got to move on from the friendship. And sometimes you got to cut ties and not only like with, with relationships, with your business the processes you're doing within your business to kind of get you to that next level. Um, on the topic of like sourcing and dealing with books, I always tell everybody here, hey, put out a free ad. You'll take books for free. Is this something you do down there? And if so, is there like, do a lot of people are like, hey, Mel, come get, you know, my house full of books? Yeah, I haven't done it recently because I've just had an abundance of books coming at me. But whenever I'm low on inventory, yeah, I'll put out a call out on Facebook Marketplace. I've also got pamphlets that I will letterbox drop if I go for a walk or I'll sometimes pin them up on notice boards if I'm at the shop. So I normally have like a pile of pamphlets in my car or around um, just for those times. But yeah, I definitely, I mean, that's how I really got into the books full time was doing those call outs saying, you know, I'm looking for books, <laughs> free books, or sometimes I'll put on there that I'll also pay for the books or whatever. But it's definitely putting out call outs. It's just the way you word it. I think you have to just be careful how you word it and the books will, will come to you. Yeah. So I know you said you did a little bit of CDs and DVDs. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you've been doing a while now or is that something 
where that has to meet a certain ASP metric for you just to even touch it? No, I think like always back from when I was a bit of an everything seller with clothes and shoes and some books, I always still had some DVDs and some CDs, but whenever I did them, I always tried to lot those ones. So I'm not really one to do the individual DVDs or CDs. I'd rather lot them into like a series or, um, you know, the same kind of like I used to, I did a haul once where I got a lot of CDs that were all classical. So I bundled them all together. And cause I knew nothing about classical music. I just bundled them together by, all the strings or the orchestras or the choirs or whatever. And I'll still sometimes look for stuff like that. I've got quite a lot of media in my death. I still do have like a death pile of media because there's a lot of it that's scratched and I'm just, there's a lot of good stuff there. And I've, I've learned that it's good stuff just by being with Tom. So I know that some of the media that I've got is good, but I, like a lot of it's scratched and I just don't want to be going reliant on listing it and then having to go over to Tom's all the time and say, Hey, can I borrow the disc cleaner? Cause I don't think that's fair. <laughs> so I will get a disc. Well, cleaner. He just has to set a quarter machine. Next yeah. to it. And every time you need to use yeah. it, you put a quarter in it. Yes, true. <laughs> he, he likes to be in control. I don't think he'd want me using his disc machine. <laughs> yeah. He's one of the only people that's allowed to touch his disc cleaning machine. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I would just stay away. I'd rather have my own. <laughs> if I break it, then it's on me. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. So yeah. what is the biggest learning lesson you've learned on the entire reselling journey? Or the most impactful Ooh. at least? Um, the biggest learning lesson. I mean, I, I mean, the, the lesson I learned the most was doing that death poll. Definitely. <laughs> that was just like a pivotal thing in my in my whole reselling career was how I just got so out of control with that death pile and that unlisted inventory. And I think that's so common for so many resellers. Um, I guess the, the biggest things to learn from it is that it, it's hard work. It takes discipline. It takes consistency, <laughs> all these kind of things. It's not like a little easy side hob it's not a side job you have to take this like a real business I think one of the other things I'm really learning at the moment which is via tech is like the metrics and knowing my numbers I feel like I've said this recently like for the last few years I kind of feel like I've just done eBay like I've just been doing it I get there I photograph I list I get it up I ship it but I don't feel like I'm actually in control of the business. So it's only now that I'm gone back, fixing up the mistakes, going through this unlisted imagery, now doing my metrics every day, writing down my, you know, my notepad here, how many things I'm listing, how many things are selling for over the metrics, keeping track of the daily sales and the expenses and stuff. I think that is one of the most underrated things. Um, and that's probably my biggest life lesson at the moment is is knowing where I'm at within the business and not just doing eBay. <laughs> I got to be like running a business as such. I'm curious. Have I think a lot of resellers run into this. Have you become more pickier with the items you pick up from when you started selling books to today? Because I know personally for me, I used to, you know, I'll buy a book for a dollar if I can make two bucks on Amazon. Them days are long gone behind me. Like I just like leave it for somebody else. Have you had kind of the same experience in your business? Yeah, I'm trying to pick up those books that are higher now. Like, and I will, some of them I will just leave or I'll give them to Tom because he's a different level seller than me. Like he's a, he's got a lot more space. He can have like a lower metric than what I can have. So I'm definitely trying to pick better books now or trying to bundle up books that are lower end so that I can get my ASP up by doing the bundling. So yeah, I, I'm definitely more picky than I was and I only want to, I will still do those books that only make that small profit as long as I know that they're going to be a fast sell through rate. I'm yeah. curious. Uh, well, one more thing here, Johnny, before you jump in, when it comes to, I ask every, every eBay seller, this, it's like a right of the podcast promoted listings. Do you use them? Are they required? Are they a scam? What is your take on promote? I personally, I use them. I know Johnny uses them as well, but some people, you know, they're like, I don't believe it. It's like an extra fee. Uh, what's your take on promoted listings? Do you think it's worth it? Do you need it? 
Yeah, hundred percent. I do pro promoted listings, and I do think it's worth it. Um, and I do think it's needed, especially in like the book market, because it's a sat saturated book. Catch book books are saturated, and and obviously there's some books that are rare, and they're not as there's not as many of them listed on eBay, and they don't probably need the promoted listings. But I just promote at a flat rate throughout the whole store whether or not it's a rare book or a basic rate, I just have a flat rate that goes through my entire store and doesn't change. And that seems to work okay for me. Yeah. And even on the rare, obscure stuff, sometimes it's so obscure and so rare, nobody's ever heard of it. And it doesn't yeah. mean it's not worth money or there's not an interest in it, just people aren't aware of it. So that's partially why I use promoted listings myself is just yeah. to get exposure on my more weird oddities. Um, so are we going to do more cds and dvds in the future you think or is that a nah i'm just going to deal with what i have um i think i look at them a little bit more now just because i've learned by because i'm always picking with tom and he's pick he's obviously a primarily a CD seller. So he's kind of taught me a lot along the way. And he's he's of the mindset that if I'm going to a, a charity shop to look at the bookshelf, I may as well quickly look at the CD shelf as well while I'm in there. Um, it's because sometimes you'll go into a charity shop and there'll be hardly, you'll walk out with one book. So if you're only going to, for your time, if you're going to go there, maybe it's best to have a look for some something else as well. I think if I... I'll probably list the the stuff that I've got as long as it's not too low end. But I think if I was going to go down a CD, I probably wouldn't bother with the DVDs at this point. But if I was going to go down a CD route, I think I'll focus on bundling my CDs. So I don't think I'll be that CD seller that's looking to do individual CDs. I will do, I will bundle. Yeah. Right. I, I'm looking to get into DVDs and CDs late this year or maybe in 2025 myself but most of that's primarily going to go to amazon to be honest um probably a little bit of it will go to ebay uh, especially if, if i get into cross listing um just well I'll just be part of the ebay process um so on that note are there any other platforms you would like to sell on and uh where you're at not actual platforms. We don't really have many platforms here in Australia. So I don't think there's any other platforms. If whatnot comes to Australia, it would definitely be of interest to me. I don't know if it's going to come here. And the only other thing that I would like to do is build my own website now. I'm kind of at that point where I think I would like to have a back from burnout website. Well, and you can put all your own traffic with your own YouTube channel. Makes sense. Yeah, do it. Yeah, if I could have some kind of software that also listed cross listed my items over into my own website store, then possibly yeah, I would be interested in that. Yeah, oh, I think that's genius, especially with uh, your following you have. You should definitely do that, in my opinion. But everybody's free to run their business how they see fit. Back to my corner. Yeah, I know. I think it would actually be um, quite good, and like before. One of my previous jobs before I was a photographer, I actually had an online party business, kids party business. So I used to import all these party supplies in from America and I would sell them on my own website. And occasionally I would sell some on eBay back then, but most of the time I just did my own website. So I actually learned in that process, I learned a lot about SEO. I learned a lot about building my own website and, and selling on my own website. So I've got, I do have past experience on that. But now also I've built myself a brand. So I do think that not only would I be able to be able to attract probably people through my brand, but I think that I would also probably be smart enough to be able to know how to market that website outside of my brand as well to just bring in regular people who in then in turn might become followers and of my actual YouTube as well. So it would work together. So yeah, definitely, definitely something that's, I built the I've all the other websites that I've ever had before. I've built myself on WordPress. I've done them myself. So I feel like I could build my own back from burnout one. I would just, it's just a time thing really for me of having that time to actually sit down and play around and make my own website. 
you were hustling way before eBay ever even came into your mind. It's like you were you always been out there hustling different kind of gigs. It's just you just happen to land on eBay and it's been sticking for the years. So we always ask everybody yeah. like, what is the best piece of advice you would give? Maybe somebody listening today is thinking about getting into reselling uh, or, you know, they're just started reselling. Like what's the one piece or it doesn't even got to be one piece, just a summary of your best advice you would give to a new reseller out there. Yeah, I think it would be price comp everything. <laughs> Don't just buy what you like and what you think is nice or cool. Like it's, reselling is not just about what you like. I mean, it's good to be able to sell things in a category that you like, that you've got an interest on it, but often things that we have personal attachments to and we like, we think they're going to sell and they don't end up being the, the best sellers. Um, I would tell people to not, not have emotions really in the actual business. It is very black and white. It is very, it is a business don't be emotional about it. Set your business boundaries from the beginning, your own business rules, your own business boundaries, and then stick to those boundaries because it's easy to get sidetracked um, if you don't have a plan for your business. <laughs> so by putting some boundaries into place about what you will and will not accept, that'll really help you as well. And um, be mindful of who you consume and be mindful of who you um hang around with like we were talking about before you know like you do need to hang around with positive people and people who are you know interested in 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 growing and not there there are toxic communities within the community so just be mindful of who you associate with and yeah I, at the you know have fun with it but go slowly learn properly don't rush into things and try to, I mean, everybody needs to have some bad buys to learn from, but, you know, the more you can price comp and learn about eBay before you actually dive into it full time, the better. Yeah. What do we I have to you look need to be doing it. You need to do it for a little while as a part-timer, I feel like. And I also feel like you need to experiment with genres when you're new and find what you like. Like I I actually feel like it was very helpful for me to be a clothing seller first because when you do clothing, you learn a lot about returns and you have a lot more customer problems than I have with books now. So I think by learning these different genres first before finding the genre that I wanted to actually stick to, yeah, that, that was really, really important. Yeah, for sure. I always tell everybody like, don't just like, don't just start selling books on eBay because Mel's doing it, right? It's like, yes. it's one of the most saturated categories. Run away from media. Everybody listening, like it's one of the most saturated categories out there. It is fun to, especially if you're in the books, but it is a lot more work than some other categories. And it can be, you know, a, a low ASP at times. It comes from it. I'm curious here and everybody's probably curious, like, what are we looking forward to 2024, your YouTube channel, your passion this year? You're going to, you know, full-blown YouTube as best as you can. What do we have in the future lined up? I think, um, firstly, I just want to say you're right there. Don't just copy what everybody else does. That's one of the biggest mistakes. I got a lot of people that just will flat out copy my store. But then they, what happens is they become very reliant on only learning what I put out there. And there's a lot of stuff that I don't put out there. So you you need to do the work for yourself and you need to learn. And, and also what's available for me in my area might not be available for Johnny in his area. And if like you can't build a business around something that you can't actively source. <laughs> so I think that's like a, one of the biggest problems is you see these people on YouTube and people want to copy and do exactly the same, but it doesn't necessarily crossover into that so yeah i'll just say that <laughs> but no, i no, think no, you're, you're absolutely yeah. spot on and no disrespect to the gentleman but i try copying the hairy tornado method did not work out at all for me yeah. just saying yeah nothing wrong with this yeah. channel or the guy at all but as far as what we're talking about copying do your own thing you'll be better off honestly yeah and, and it even comes down to business relationships like i have a business relationship with 
somebody that gives me a cert, a particular type of book, a lot of them, right? So if somebody's following me, they might be like, oh, she puts all this stuff into her store, so it must be good. But little do they know that I've got like a deal going where I get all this stuff for very, very cheap. So like that's the only reason why a lot of it will go into my store. So <laughs> I think that there's stuff that people don't know and, um, yeah, you definitely can't just copy what somebody else is doing. You have to do your own research. Are we going to yeah. see like a, 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 I'm not sure if you're familiar with the the MTV show Cribs where they go and tour like houses. Um, so basically they go in like celebrities houses. When you get your house all dressed up here that you just moved into, are we going to have like a full blown tour of everything? Oh yeah, I, I've done the empty tour. So when I get it all filled up, I'll do the full blown tour. I think that's what, that was the next part of your story when you were saying what's on for the YouTube or whatever this year. That's something that I would um, really like to kind of go down. Like my my YouTube channel is a lot about like reselling and it's Mel the reseller, but it's also very, I take people on a personal journey and it's about me and my life in general. So I think now that I'm in my own space and stuff, I've got some ideas for some different types of videos and I would very much like to, introduce maybe every fortnight or something like a video that's not just about reselling do you know what I mean it's more of a, it's still maybe like it's it's about me and my life and maybe there's part of that is some reselling going to a thrift shop or something but it's kind of um not not solely reselling I guess that would that would be my goal but to do a video like that every two weeks means I have to be doing more videos than I currently am because I'm not just going to have one video every two weeks. It's about, about you know, me in Australia, my life in Australia or anything like that. So, yeah, I've got a lot of big plans for the YouTube channel. It's just um, always comes down to my time and trying to find like some kind of routine, which I'm hoping now I'm in this new house I can actually find, but it's, it's definitely hard. So I'm going to get the reverse of a previous question I asked you. What are your favorite books to list on eBay? Okay. My favorite books to list would be books that I personally like myself. So that's... I'm just saying, um, man, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chick lit, romance no. novels. Yeah. <laughs> Nora. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Johnny hates selling Nora Roberts. I'm, I'm down to sell Nora Roberts. She sells for me. You can have them all when you come down here. You can have them all. No, you no. You have to bundle them. I, I, I figured this out. You can't sell them individually. It's impossible. Yeah, you, you have to bundle them. But you, you can bring some really good money if you bundle that type of books. So, yeah, there's um, – I like selling the chick lit, the romance, um, the cookbooks, <laughs> The, all the girly type of books, I guess that's, and the self-help. I'm really, sometimes I'll pick the self-help up, even though I know it doesn't make me very much money, but it might be a book that like, is it like some of those really, really common self-help books, they don't make you much money, but they just sell and sell and sell over and over and over very quickly. So I like to put those in my store because they are books that bring buyers, they are looking for those those very popular self-help books and it brings buyers to the store and then hopefully they'll look around the store and buy something else while they're there. There yeah. is one romance that I like listing. It's the medical romances because they sell. How do medical romance yeah. do for you in Australia? Do they do well? It does. Medical romance does really well for me, but it's very hard to find. Same. I, what, I love what finding is, What even is medical romance? <laughs> There's your doctor on the front. Oh, or yeah. yeah. He's, he's that, that's shirtless the, that's and he's got the, the stethoscope around his neck. Yeah. Not necessarily. There's actually a decent storyline. I know way more about this than I really should. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, they're more clothed than you think they are, Mike. <laughs> I stand by my statement that if somebody out on eBay had a romance novel only bookstore and they hired hunky men that were shirtless tanned up and oiled up and they held the book for the main ebay photo they would get a lot of i don't sales. think you're wrong and i think that's genius that's even, the if, the, even yeah. if he had the hunk sign the book right you know hunk right or whatever his name is right brian the hunk he signs the book you get it boom right i'm telling you there's you got to think outside the box of reselling anymore free business model for those listening 
I, you know, I actually think you're a hundred percent correct. Like there, um, I actually think that's brilliant. I've never ever thought about that. <laughs> I've seen women standing there in, in like, different things but I've never seen like a hunky male I wonder if there's a mannequin with a whole lot of abs that you could somehow set like a stand up I don't know I, 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 I think the bottle, a, like those highland brilliant. Scottish romances you can be in a kilt holding a Scottish romance oh, would, we, we could... I, I, that that would kill it it would absolutely kill it and I definitely feel like you could have an entire eBay store that was just romance novels and you would kill it mm -hmm. it is a it's one of my top sellers and it's I, I will sell those Mills and Boone, Silhouette, Harlequin, whatever novels you want to call them, over and over and over on repeat every day. I think we could try an experiment with Tom after a long day of work. You know, <laughs> we can cut his sleeves off his shirt, have him hold up a few yeah. books, you know, just quick and easy. Right? Tom, listen, just hold the book. Don't worry about what we're doing with it. All right. Just a few pictures. All right. And then we'll see where it goes from there. Who knows? oh that's hilarious <laughs> I'll, I'll get him to do one I promise <laughs> you probably could photoshop one I don't it's actually a great it's actually a fantastic idea <laughs> all right we're gonna wrap it up there Mel we appreciate you spending your morning with us and uh we're looking forward to what you do this year we're all excited for the YouTube channel the growth of your eBay business so yeah thanks for hanging out with us today thanks for having me appreciate it Thanks for listening to another episode of the Reseller's Mindset Podcast. Today's full episode and all previous episodes are available to all YouTube members along with the weekly Zoom call and private Discord. Head on over to youtube.com backslash the used book guy and consider joining for as little as $2.99 a month.